think we all need a pep talk. I don't know everything, I'm just a kid. But I do know this. The world's so big, and the world's so small. Sometimes it feels like we can't do anything at all. But the world can be better, in spite of its faults. The world can be better, and you'll be the cause. You'll be the cause. You'll be the cause. The world can be better, and you'll be the cause. Too rough, diverged in the woods. And I took the road less traveled. You hurt, man! Not cool, Robert Frost. But was there were a word to pass? I hope you know when that leads to awesome. It's like Jeremy said, don't stop believing. Unless you dream stupid, then you should get a better dream. Even though the waves are bigger than my boat, the wind keeps us sailing. It's not me. My name is Michael Torgerson and I teach government and economics here. Two of the images I use in this presentation are mine, the rest are courtesy of the internet. I do not have any conflicts of interest to declare, but I do have an interest in keeping my job at RCC. The title of this presentation is How to Teach in a World Gone Mad Without Going Mad. It's been a weird year, to say the least. There's a Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. I'm not real sure whether that's a blessing or a curse, but what I do know is that this has truly been a time of deep change, massive disruption, and societal unrest. From before the time of our republic's founding, we have struggled with our country's birth defect of slavery and ongoing disease of racism. For too long, the depth of racism in American life has been underestimated. The surgery to extract it is necessarily complex and detailed. As a beginning, it's important to x-ray our history and reveal the full extent of the disease. And just as a doctor has to cut into healthy tissue to access the infection underneath, we need to undergo this current pain so that we can excise the malignancy that runs deep under the surface of our culture. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for a while. We as educators have faced not only the dynamics of the pandemic and the devastating jolt to our personal and educational systems that revolt resulted from it, we've also had to deal with an unknown present and the unknowable future. We are used to conveying lessons, grading papers, fostering critical thinking and communications, and updating and adapting our curricula to incorporate changes in our subjects, while all the while making content meaningful and relevant to our students, implementing new ideas around the art and science of teaching, and adopting the latest technology to best position our students for success in their post-RCC world, all the while making it look easy. In this article, originally written for educators in the health professions, there are eight recommendations that model how to pause, recognize, and reflect even as we care for others. These recommendations are, I believe, applicable to our educational practice as well. The eight recommendations are educate yourself on how current strife is embedded in historical context. 
recognize that students may be struggling with social isolation, cognitive overload, depression, anger, pain, sorrow, fear, detachment, and other feelings that can interfere with their learning and engagement in classrooms, create safe non-judgmental spaces for students to engage in discussions about large-scale current events, reach out, be flexible, monitor your own motions and levels of engagement, and if you feel unsure about the how to discuss racism in the classroom, trust the Diversity Program Board. And finally, let students guide selection of inequity inquiries. Teachers have a responsibility to teach ourselves about the historical, social, and cultural situatedness of structural racism, as well as the social determinants in the learning environment. But this is not enough. Once we've informed ourselves, we also have a duty to motivate our students to understand these dynamics as well. This is not merely limited to the golden rule and stopping overt acts when we see them, but also the less obvious, more insidious words and deeds that tend to creep into our daily lives and interactions, things that Dr. Baston called microaggressions. True, there are things we cannot change, like discrimination and housing and hiring, police brutality and mass incarceration, but there are things that we can affect implicit bias, quote-unquote jokes, things we grew up saying or hearing our parents and family say, things that our circle of peers or students use, things that are prevalent in pop culture regardless of how they are intended. Now this is not by any stretch a recent phenomenon, nor is it limited to one racial or ethnic group. Ours is a history that is an ongoing object lesson in what not to do in terms of race relations and how to develop a civil society. Our history is one where the oppressed feel no other outlet of release than to rise up and express their outrage. And this revolution is genuine because it was born from the same womb that always gives birth to massive social upheavals, the womb of intolerable conditions and unendurable situations. Recognize that students may be struggling with social isolation, cognitive overload, depression, anger, pain, sorrow, fear, detachment, and other feelings that can interfere with their learning and engagement. The last normal day we had was Friday the 13th last year. Then, all of a sudden, we were all told to go home and stay home. The schools all closed, but we did get a chance to learn a cool new skill. <laughs> Cities turned into ghost towns overnight, nobody could come over, and the masks. Seriously? With the masks? I think it's safe to say that this new normal sucks, but that is our experience of this. What about our students? I know that it seems like this is what we see from our side of the podium, but for the students, it's really pulled the rug out from under them. This is not the college experience they were looking forward to. Robert Quinn, in his book Deep Change, makes the differentiation between incremental change and deep change. Incremental change is safe, comfortable, measured, nothing more really than an extension of our past. But most of all during incremental change, we are totally in control. Deep change, on the other hand, is sudden, massive, transformational, and terrifyingly irreversible. Most importantly, we are not in control. Most of us build our identities around our knowledge and competence in employing certain known techniques and abilities. Making a deep change involves abandoning both and walking naked into the land of uncertainty. This is usually a terrifying choice, often involving a dark night of the soul. I've been teaching online classes since the days of Angel, and when my students register for class, they know they're stepping into a virtual land of self-paced asynchronous learning where they're going to have to manage their time and workload by themselves. It's suboptimal, but it is what it is. But for those who've been thrown suddenly and probably unwillingly into the deep end of the internet, the shock can be overwhelming. Their comfort zone is gone, 
their known world is no more, and they have been forced to walk naked into the land of uncertainty, not only in school, but at their work, in family, and in social life. Then, all of a sudden... The manifestation of this dark night of the soul can be missed assignments, poor performances on tests, a disconnect in the discussion forums or on Zoom. There's only so much bandwidth that a student has before they start to flip out. Think of your student who's had life happen during their class. She comes to you, tells her tale, and is hoping for some lenient consideration while she puts the pieces of her life back together. This past year, nearly every student has experienced this level of life happening, and it's terrifying. Students who are used to being on it in class are now falling behind. They see their performance slipping, and that creates new sensations for them. Failure, anxiety, loss of ability, and loss of control, they, they feel they're being done to by life, the universe, and everything. So we need to continue to extend understanding and grace and provide the support and guidance that they absolutely need to have. We've got to remember that the feelings they have are similar to the feelings that we're having, but theirs are amplified because all of this is going on their transcript. Creating safe, non-judgmental spaces for students to discuss large-scale current events is going to be a lot easier in the social sciences and humanities than in, say, phys ed or math class. I'll be the first to recognize it can be a challenge to draw a bright-line correlation between the major events of the day and the mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell. But as much as we can, we have to have our antennas finely tuned in to the concerns that students have about these times. And when appropriate, we should allow ourselves to pause, take a break from curricular concerns, and turn to focus on care and connect. Not for a long amount of time, but enough to recognize the concern, allow it to be expressed, and then get back into the learning environment. In my government classes, I have dedicated entire discussion forums to current events and ask me anything, and the students blow it up with questions and comments. Sometimes I'll play the devil's advocate to encourage further deep thought into the topic, but most of the time I support and reinforce the concerns that are raised, and by summarizing the discussion every so often, I'm able to bring voice to the unspoken undercurrent of the topic, which spurs continued debate and hopefully more understanding. The college has so many resources for the academic community to come together safely and without judgment and discuss these issues. They sponsor presentations that are truly value added and not just spraying us all down with the hose of knowledge and hoping that it seeps in somewhere. The Diversity Programming Board challenges us to engage in a true discussion and foster deeper understanding. Used to be that I would primarily reach out to the students who I saw not engaging very much at all, and it then usually by email, you know, the old 80-20 thing. But during the Rona, I found that I was sending how y'all doing notes and phone calls two or three times a term out to everybody. And I also kept a lot closer track of the gradebook so that I could see if there was a downward trend in students' grades or participation. The fact that students are spending so much time in front of their computers, not only for school, but for research, reading, and time streaming entertainment, gaming, and social media, it can feel like sometimes they are drinking from the fire hose, especially if they get caught in a social media echo chamber where the discussion revolves solely around one side of an issue to the abandonment of different voices and alternative viewpoints.
I acknowledge the worldwide current events are overwhelming, troubling, and that the students feel incapable of changing anything about their own current life experience, let alone changing the world. And that's when I encourage them, very strongly, to log off. I tell them to go outside and let the sun shine warm upon their face. I tell them to look at the majesty of the physical world and to know that it may not be all right now, but it will be all right. Remember the student who had life happen in your class? She's still struggling. She's missed a couple deadlines because she's putting the pieces of the emergent needs in her life back together, and now she's in the unenviable position of playing catch-up and keep-up on top of everything else. True, part of the college experience is teaching structure, academic discipline, and the soft skills of how to quote-unquote adult in the real world, but deadlines are going to exist forever. Requirements have to be met, and deliverables must be uh, delivered. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing, unless you do your job, I cannot do mine. And lather, rinse, repeat. Deadlines and due dates not only teach the students time and workflow management, but it also gives us a steady, manageable pace. We've got to get assignments graded and returned in a timely manner, but when they all pile up in our inbox the second to the last day of class, along with all the requests for just a little more time... We teachers experience a very different dark night of the soul. Some lessons, like in lab science, simply cannot be delayed or else the student ends up creating a new life form. But in my classes, I've moved to a suggested timeline rather than a strict course calendar. I tell my students they're responsible for the work required that I'm providing them with a suggested timeline to keep them apace in the class and that the only solid deadline is the last day of school. As such, I've seen fewer students leave everything to the last minute and more students are finishing content early and class scores overall are improving. I also send out pestergrams encouraging them to stay on target with the proposed timeline. We've been focusing on the students up until now, but how are you doing? What is the state of your mental health? When is the last time you checked in on a colleague to see if they're all right? This article is focused on healthcare professional educators, but this particular recommendation more than any other speaks to me the deepest. We are good. Some of us are great. <laughs> but all of us need scheduled maintenance or else we are going to blow an O-ring and be no good to anybody. We have the same stressors as our students and then some. For us, our big thing is we have to worry about our dean observing our class while we're still trying to figure out how the Dropbox feature works. We don't have to worry about our classwork ending up on our transcripts or being able to transfer to a really, really good university. We have pressures that far exceed that. We want to do our best, not just for our students in our college, but for ourselves. We have an internal drive to succeed that if we could bottle it and sell it, well, I know personally I'd be teaching remotely from the beach on Maui. Self-care is something we frequently preach, but infrequently practice. It's okay to not be okay. It's fine to lean on somebody else. It's all right to be overwhelmed with frustration and anger that has no acceptable outlet except to let it sit and eat our insides and break our hearts. But it doesn't have to. HR sent out the EAP emails a few times, and that's as good as far as it goes. But I find that the best way for me to work on my problems is to support somebody else with theirs. And in the helping, I find peace of mind, I reestablish and reinforce the connection, and sometimes I even find the path to answering my own issue while listening to, but not fixing, the issues of others.
If you're unsure about how to discuss racism in the classroom, the college has resources for that, not only about discussing the hard topics, but how to educate ourselves. I find personally nothing is worse than participating in a discussion only to find out that I've been wrong the whole time. That really does a number on my self-confidence, because then I start to think, what else have I been wrong about, and how is this going to affect my credibility with my students in the future? One of the best compliments I've ever gotten in class was the student who came up to me after turning their poli sci final in and asked me, okay, what are you, a Democrat or a Republican? I turned it around and asked what she thought I was, and her answer was, I really don't know. I've been trying to figure it out all term. Now, there are some things that are important to leave outside the classroom, religion and politics being the main ones. Personal opinions on social issues are kind of dicey because your stance may alienate some of your students who hold differing beliefs or who may not have yet been exposed to differing belief systems. Granted, there are some personal opinions that are universal. Uh, bad people doing wrong things for evil reasons is, is not okay. But those darn students have a way of asking the questions that you've been trying to avoid all term. Avoiding them partly because your answer would be personal editorial opinion, but also partly because you may have incomplete information. In these cases, trust the system to have your back. Trust the diversity program board to be able to come to the rescue and help you with the hard topics. Unless it is specifically the topic under examination for the day, it can be very challenging to fit in a current event topic as big as structural racism or police brutality. You know, think, think back to the poor little mitochondria. It, it's doing the best it can. I found that the best discussions often occur organically. A student will sideswipe an issue, then turn back around and hone in on it. Others in the class suddenly sit up straight, start to listen more, and that's the time when teaching and learning happens. I cannot count the number of times when I've gone through an entire class period on a fascinating discussion, only to have to tell the students on their way out the door, you know, I was going to talk about federalism and the Tenth Amendment, but you're going to have to read that for yourself. Ask questions next time if you're stumped, but I believe this was a much more value-added talk. A few years ago, I posted one of those say three words on how we met things on Facebook, and one of my Forder students wrote, Election Day 2000. I was teaching BA 131 in the Rogue Valley Computer Lab. It was a cold Tuesday night in November, and my class was set up as a learning lab. Students would work independently until they got stuck, and then they'd come over and we would work one-on-one -on -one to get them unstuck until, until they got it and were able to get past that learning block. I was keeping an eye on the returns between helping students and saw that Florida had been called for Al Gore. Hmm, okay. A little later, they withdrew that call and then called Florida for Bush. Hmm. Then they withdrew that call. One of my students asked me how the election was going and who was winning. I stopped the class, I turned on the overhead with the red-blue state map, and I said three words that led to a 45-minute discussion. This is unprecedented. They asked questions and we covered a wide range of topics like the electoral college, polling data, how the news people call a race. At 8.50 I dismissed the class with these words. Pay attention to this. You are living through history and this is a long way from being over. We are living in truly interesting times. Things are nowhere near what they should be and probably won't for quite a while. However, we educators have a duty not only to help make sense of things, but to blaze a trail for others to follow, to be a guide and counsel for our students and for each other. We cannot work to fix a broken system if we ourselves question our own sufficiency of abilities and resources. And most of all, we cannot sit idly by and wait for others to find a solution.
Senator Tim Scott said last night that America is not a racist country. Do you agree with that? And what do you make of his warning against fighting discrimination with more discrimination? I believe that we need to address, well, first of all, no, I don't think America is a racist country, but we also do have to speak truth about the history of racism in our country and its, and its existence today. What we know from the intelligence community, one of the greatest threats to our national security is domestic terrorism manifested by white supremacists. And so these are issues that we must confront, and it, doesn't, it does not help to heal our country, to unify us as a people, to ignore the realities of that. And let's deal with it knowing we all have so much more in common than what separates us. And the idea is that we want to unify the country, but not without um, speaking truth and, and requiring accountability as appropriate. It has to be emphasized that just because some Americans are racist, it does not necessarily follow that America itself is a racist nation. Just because there are incidents of police brutality, it does not necessarily follow that all cops are brutal. We cannot afford to sit back and allow the few bad apples among us to define us all. We have to acknowledge that there are differing American experiences for different Americans, based on race, gender identity, age, weight, you name it. We must teach the twin concepts of promoting anti-racism as well as opposing those who would use such a broad brush to paint all people merely because the actions of a few. For in doing so, we would be allowing the same intolerance as that which we are now called on to oppose by all of the means at our disposal. We also cannot lapse back into the rhetoric and mindset of absolutes. This is not a binary choice. We cannot also allow ourselves or others to feel that they're in a racial bystander syndrome where we believe we can choose not to act because certainly somebody else will. We have the means at our disposal and we must use them because only through education, repeated and focused messaging Will our students know and be able to pass on to their peers and children that societal attitudes are evolving, that the old ways of thinking are being cast aside in favor of new ways, and that it is up to each and every one of us to act so that we can bring about the change that is so desperately needed in our college, in our city, in our state, and in our nation? Racism bigotry and intolerance is learned over time. It's not the result of one action or one idea. It is a persistent stream of low-level smog that slowly poisons the brain and manifests itself as the societal ugliness that we're seeing around us today. But just as racism is learned over time, it can also be unlearned. And the concepts of tolerance, acceptance, and anti-racism can be relearned and reinforced in their place. So, I challenge you to find ways to make a difference today. It doesn't need to be a moonshot level achievement. It can be the small, simple efforts that are done with faith and integrity. So please. Take care of your students, take care of your colleagues, and most importantly, take care of yourself. My name is Michael Torgerson. I am glad that you are here today, and I want to leave you with this. South, we will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it.